Please remain standing as you are able for our scripture. Today it comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these things that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who truly believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Let us take a look at Nicodemus. And I want to start off by saying that it has been very interesting to watch the portrayal of Nicodemus in the series The Chosen because I think it brings some insights as we see these people as people, regular people. Um, we're going to be doing the third season of The Chosen starting in April, but uh, that's not for this morning. What do we know about Nicodemus? Well, he was um, probably rich, well-connected. He was a Pharisee, part of the Sanhedrin, that's the Jewish sort of supreme council. And we know that he felt the need to talk with Jesus, and so he came to Jesus at nighttime. Logical question would be to ask, why? Why, why did you come at the night? Was he wary of being seen with his controversial carpenter? This man who was beginning to challenge the very structures and institutions of Nicodemus' faith, calling into question things that this man had held dear for most, if not all, of his life up to that point. Or was it a more practical reason? Was Jesus so surrounded by people by day that the only real opportunity for a long one-on-one -on -one with him was at nighttime? when the crowds had gone home and he could get Jesus away by himself for a, a brief time. May have been a little of both. But why come at all? Might be a more important question. 
And I believe the answer to that is that Nicodemus was searching for something, some truth, some understanding of God that he had apparently failed to find in all of his years of devout, earnest, religious observances. Don't badmouth this man. He was doing the best he could and he thought he was doing what his God wanted him to do. He's trying very hard to get it right. And then this guy comes up and starts saying these things. And it begins to resonate. When we hear something true, it calls to us. We respond to it. I think that's part of having that divine spark in us. It recognizes when it encounters truth and so Nicodemus is hearing truth in this man's words and he's got to find out well am I really hearing the truth or do I need to keep looking do you ever feel like Nicodemus feel like you've done the best you can and you're searching for the truth the meaning you're you're yearning for something more something that is real in your faith to give you hope and life and purpose. Now Nicodemus was not a stupid man and at first when he seems to misunderstand what Jesus said about being born again and he asked, well did Jesus mean physically born again or does he mean being made new or change from above, I think it may have been a little stalling tactic. Have you ever done that? Somebody asks you something and you kind of deliberately misunderstand to give you a chance to think or maybe get a little more information before you commit. Oh, so born again, and, and exactly what is, what is that? I mean, I'm an old man and my mother's passed away. I mean, how am I gonna, you know, shrink back to a baby? And that's not what you mean, obviously. So what, what do you mean? because surely it couldn't be a physical rebirth but after Jesus explains that a person must through the power from above let go of the past and began a new life with a new heart with a changed attitude Nicodemus asks a very important question he doesn't argue this he simply says how can these things be? How do you do this? But Jesus gave an answer to Nicodemus that is still true today, still speaks to us today. When he says, you know, the how of it is not what matters. You don't have to understand every bit about what's happening in order for it to be effective. To kind of, what matters is this new life, this rebirth that is a gift from above. In more modern terms, you don't have to understand the principles of the internal combustion engine to drive a car. You don't have to understand how antibiotics can cure a disease in order to use them and get well get better and just like those two common examples you don't have to understand the love of God to experience it to be saved healed freed by it you simply have to accept it God will do the heavy lifting The good news, the gospel truth is that because God loves the world, the world being each and every one of us in all creation, and don't we have trouble swallowing that? Oh, I can give you a list of people that God doesn't need to be loving on. Every one of us has got a few people that we would like to put on that God doesn't love you list. But there is no such list. God loves each and every one of us. 
God loves us so much he sent his son Jesus to die not in order to appease some bloodlust of God's or some need for revenge so that we might finally understand how much God loves each of us. Under that old system, and this would have been very clear to Nicodemus and practicing Jews of that time, we should know it now too. When you sin, when you go against God's will, when you hurt somebody, there is a cost that has to be paid to put things right. Under the old system of sacrifice, a lot of animals were slaughtered to pay the price of making things right again. And so when Jesus steps up and says, I will be the final sacrifice, It's to drive home the point to us, sin is bad, it costs everything. So God says, I will give everything so you don't have to. That's why Christ died on the cross, so that we didn't have to. Even though he was the only one that didn't need to to be on the cross. We access that love by believing in the depth and power and overwhelming nature of God's love as shown through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. All of this is so that we can come home to God in eternity. God loves us that much. He says, I don't care what you have done or not done. I want you with me, but I want you to choose that. I don't want to make you choose that. I don't want to make it like an automatic, you can't help yourself. I want you to choose to love me. So here's the way it's set up. I've paid the price. You don't have to get on the bus. But I've paid the price for you. They say that if you have John 3.16, you've got the gospel. You've got everything you need to know. I, I want to argue a little bit with that. I think Verse 17 is very important too because that's the part where it says, And Christ came into the world not to condemn the world, but to save it. 316 gives us the rationale for that. Because God loves you so much, God loves the world so much, He sent His Son not to condemn the world, but to save it. This is the truth. This is the gospel. This is what has changed the world and built hospitals and orphanages and fed starving people and brought tornado relief to places that have been devastated. Now, I don't know why God loves us so much. In fact, there are times when I don't know how God can love us so much because we can be just awful. There have been times when we've been just downright rotters about it, just ooh. But God looks beyond that. He looks and sees what is beautiful and precious in you and says, I want to bring that to the front. I don't want it to be hidden behind the masks and the cover-ups and, and the lies and the sin. You're better than that. And I want you to know that because I know that. Come home. I do know that God does love each and every one of us. And that puts a new light on how I see and relate to God and to other people and to myself. If God says that you're okay, who am I to say you're not? Who do I think I am? 
So what I say to you today is claim that promise today if you never have before, that promise of love, unconditional, forever love. Claim the promise of God's love through Christ, and if you have already claimed it, then take a look at it, at the wonder and joy of it with new eyes today. See it as if you are seeing and experiencing it for the very first time time and then together we celebrate whenever there is love there's celebration and sometimes it's big with balloons and confetti and trumpets and all that kind of stuff and sometimes it's that quiet kind of celebration like when a mother holds her baby when a a man holds his woman and it's quiet but it's a celebration. May all we do be in service to Christ. Amen.